Thank you uh, very much, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, a nice venue. Um, it was a great presentation, the last talk, and I think it's very timely for me to not have to go into some of the issues we're discussing, and that is how do you want to treat that two or three millimeter cancer in an 80-year-old or an 80-plus-year-old patient who's seeking a low morbidity option? Because we're going to be faced with those types of decisions for sure, and if we don't make them, I can tell you who's going to make them. It'll be the interventional radiologist perhaps interventional pulmonologist, uh, but it won't be the surgeons unless we really get off our duffs because we're way behind, and I'll try to explain some of that to you. RFA, a number of companies are out there making these. Uh, uh, several I've listed here, Serotechnic Radio Surgery, the primary one is CyberKnife, there are, but there are a few other vendors out there that are coming up with similar Serotechnic Radio Surgery devices. My disclosures, actually, surprisingly, I don't have any except that they're research grants from each of the companies, so we've sort of picked that each one of them to get money. I'm not on any advisory board. I'm not getting an iron for today. I don't get any money from the companies. I have no stock in these companies. Uh, should new technology or other advances change the paradigm of how we treat lung cancer? Well, that's what we're talking about today, but that's clear. Uh, who better than Rob McKenna could be in, on the pro side of that argument, pushing vatslobectomy as he has successfully and, and very, I think, uh, positively for our specialty that he did so. But there's many examples of this. EBUS versus mediastinoscopy, expandable metal stents for esophageal cancer instead of palliative bypass. I mean, it's clear this is inevitable. New technology is inevitable. It's going to change how we practice every day. There's no doubt about that. The real issue today is who's going to drive it? Who's going to drive it? Is it going to be us or is it going to be an interventional radiologist? Because if, if we don't get going, it will be other people driving it. And we will lose control of stage 1A and 1B lung cancer. And, I, and mark my words, you, we will lose it. You will not be operating on these cancers in the next decade. This is going a different direction, and we're going to lose it unless we really get going here. And I'm, I'm dead serious about this. Now, RFA is cheap. Some of the new technologies are not multi-million dollar investment. This is a 25K box. You'll get it free if you start doing these, and the probes are anywhere from $800 up to perhaps $1,800 uh, for these probes. So it's not an expensive technology. Uh, the simple thing is you just put it in the tumor and ablate it. The reason why our colleagues in general surgery are ahead of us with liver is that they've got an ultrasound machine they've been using for years in the OR. So they roll it in, and they, they can see the image uh, very well. They're, they're comfortable with it, and they treat it. So the only thing keeping us from doing this routinely is our location in the OR and our stubbornness to change our location. That's it. That is it. If we had an ultrasound that could do this in the OR, we'd be doing it today. So the reason why we can't do it with an ultrasound is obvious. It's aerated tissue. If you put a VAT scope in, the lung collapses. You can't stick it. So you need a CT scanner. So we're afraid to go out and get a CT scanner for OR because we all have the power to do it. But our liver surgeons, ask any one of them in your own institution. It's not an issue of should we be ablating li liver tumors. It's being done because they had the ultrasound machine, roll it in, stick it in with a laparoscope, boom, they've got it. But we don't have the CT scan in the OR in most centers. Now, the current status of lung RFA is, is it's being approved already by most of the vendors, so that's not an issue. And I mentioned the companies uh, that are being, uh, uh, pushing the devices right now. Long-term outcomes are still lacking, but, but I think the clinical trials are starting to look pretty good. Now, some CT surgeons have gotten involved. Steve Yang did a very nice study to show us that, yes, indeed, it's possible to ablate tumors. It's possible. That as you stick a needle in, burn it, resect it, we show that the learning curve, even holding in your hand and sticking the needle in, is there. It's not that easy to centrally deploy a needle, but, but if you can do it, he's already shown that we can get near 100% kill in these patients, which is absolutely what you need, and you need a margin. So there is a learning curve. Now, which patients should get RFA? Well, right now, it's clearly limited to peripheral small tumors. If you want to get that that complete kill with a margin, which is what we need, because at a minimum, we have to approach wedge resection. I think we'd all like to see a centimeter margin on our wedges. Um, for operable lung cancer, I say not yet. Others, Jack Roth, I don't know if he's here. I'd love to hear him comment at the break if he is, because he's pushing a randomized trial in the United States of operable patients between open or vatslobectomy versus stereotactic radiosurgery. Being done routinely in Japan for stage 1As, it'll be done in this country soon. Who's going to make the decision? That's really the issue. Bottom line is whoever does it will be the gatekeeper. You, you think you're sitting at a conference today discussing who's going to get it. 
That's over, very soon, that'll be over. Ask your favorite cardiologist in your institution who's reviewing the cath films, it's not you. It's not your cardiac surgeons. How are you gonna deliver it? One way right now, CT guided, it's the only, there's nothing else to discuss, it's CT guided. All this other issues is not happening, it's CT guided. Now if you have a couple million dollars to lay out for your stereotactic radio surgery device, that's what it'll take and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Now this is what got me started. Note the date on this, 2001 is when I first saw this patient in, in uh, actually June of 2001. 80-year-old guy, three-centimeter non-small lung, uh, cell lung cancer. I was teeing him up for resection. So he got his mead, but he did have a, a very significant history of problems. As you can see, severe emphysema, coronary disease, history of a CVA. Not your favorite one to take the surgery, but nevertheless, I was working him up. PET scan showed uh, light up in the mediastinum. I did the mead, it was negative. We, it, it, the problem was he didn't wake up the mead for about two days and I had a hard time getting him out of the hospital. He refused surgical resection. He said, well, okay, I'd rather not operate this guy. So he became my first CT guy at RFA. No way I wanted to operate the guy. But nevertheless, I, and I did one of my very first ones with, with uh, Bob Ginsburg in the room with me and actually encouraging me to look into this new technology. So this was the CT scan. This is the deployment, and this is what it takes. You've got to get dead center deployment to try to kill the tumor plus the centimeter margin. But look what we got. Early central cavitation, a very good sign, and then three years later, NED. PET negative, no growth, completely ablated. I'm telling you, this is real. This technology is real. If you can centrally deploy, it, if you can centrally deploy the needle carefully, you can ablate these tumors. Another one. Not so successful, boom. RFA, three months later, clearly a change and growing what happened. Viable tumor was left behind, why? Well, when you look at this, I mean, this looks real good and we can get these 3D images, so why did it fail in some patients? I can tell you why. Because, you know, this tumor getting the central deployment, it just doesn't always work. There's these little areas outside that you can miss. It's very subtle, that's why I put them to sleep because the whole point, it's gotta be perfect. If I got the patient rolling around and not in perfect position, like my interventional radiologists brag about doing it awake, they don't see them post-op. Post-op, they don't see them th even the day after, let alone three months or three years. But I am, and I know that unless it is absolutely perfect, the tumor will grow back like we showed in that previous slide. Now that guy went to resection because he recovered from an MI. But at the time when we did him, he, had, he was recent MI, so we RFA'd him, recovered, we did the lobectomy, had viable disease there that I showed on that slide. Now we went on to look at 19 patients with medically inoperable, and our, our, our de de definition is pretty aggressive. I can tell you that, uh, and there's the median size of the tumor, 2.6 centimeters, the average age was uh, 78 years. Uh, we had some minor complications in this 19, but I can tell you, you can get into trouble with RFA. One of our early non-small cell, it was not a non-small cell lung cancer, a MET patient, we had a death 19 days post RFA of massive hemoptysis. It was near the soup seg artery and bronchus. And I believe what happened, it cavitated, bled out. That's what I think happened. So you have to be careful where you place these. Local progression, 42%. You might say, oh, that's not so good. Well, where are we with wedge? 20%? I'm telling you, if we centrally deploy this, we can get it down much lower, and, and we can equal wedge resection of the lung if we get it lower. 13 to 19, we're still alive in a median fob of, nine, of 29 months. Estimate made a probability of overall one year survival was 95% uh, and the median survival was not reached. When we look at the survival curve, I mean, it's starting to look pretty good for a medically inoperable group of patients with a median age of close to 80 years. So this was our very earliest data of 19 patients with non-small cell lung cancer. Summary of the results, the initial response rate was close to 90%, local progression, as I mentioned, 42%, time to progression, 27 months. 13 patients were still alive at this follow-up. So I think that this data is not bad for your first 19 patients. Clearly not as good as Wedge yet, but we're getting there. And maybe they're now with some of the things we're doing differently. Um, now in terms of uh, other, we're, we've continued to collect data since 2001. This was our summary of 100 patients that was presented recently. It's not published yet, but it's been presented. But anyway, we're taking on other things like metastatic disease as well trying to keep the size lower. We learned that early on, a lot of those failures, the tumor was too big. The bigger it is, the harder it is to get the complete